As we've mentioned, you just can't talk about IT these days, it seems like, without hearing about the cloud. And another term that we consistently hear, and it goes hand in hand, is virtualization. There are many types of virtualization, though. You'll talk to people that are doing network virtualization or storage virtualization. The two types of virtualization we're going to focus on, though, in this course is server virtualization and the virtual desktop infrastructure. So let's dissect both of these together in this nugget. Server virtualization refers to running our servers as virtual machines, and notice that there is going to be some software that makes this possible. In this example, the software is going to be an operating system, and then some layer of software sitting on top of that software called the virtualization layer. A fancy term for this, by the way, is a hypervisor. So it's software, both the OS and the hypervisor, sitting on top of hardware. And notice what type of hardware are we dealing with? We're talking about shared hardware, aren't we? We have this physical disk, we have this NIC, this memory, this CPU, and it is being shared by each of the virtual machines that we're creating on top of it. We like to also refer to this hardware, therefore, as abstracted or independent hardware. I want you to know all of these terms. And this means, once again, that these physical hardware resources are not tied directly to the server that's running on them anymore, thanks to the software layers that exist in between. Now, what would be one of the huge advantages of engaging in this server virtualization? Well, certainly it is that scalability that we were discussing in the previous nugget. Scalability, remember, is that ability to dynamically grow our infrastructure as demand increases. So we can quickly spin up new virtual machines as needed to meet demand. Once again, using that independent hardware that exists. But is there any challenges? I want you to think for a moment. What do you think would be a challenge of this situation for us? And I'll even add this. Let's say this is customer A right here, and this right here is customer B. Does that make you think of a big challenge that we're going to run into when we engage in this server virtualization? Sure, the challenge would be security. So one of our steps when we are doing server virtualization with the cloud is we need to make sure, especially in an environment like I just described, where you have multiple customers, we need to make sure the security infrastructure is in place to protect this stuff. A fancy term that we use for having multiple customers sharing this abstracted or independent hardware is called multi tenancy. And since I can't spell that, I'll just abbreviate it MT. Multi-tenancy is the fancy term that we like to use with cloud technologies where we have this shared hardware. Now, this server virtualization can lead to another neat virtualization trick, and this is called the virtual desktop infrastructure. What we do is we spin up a VM that isn't a server anymore. The VM that we spin up is going to be a client operating system. Maybe it's Windows 10, for instance, that we spin up in the cloud, and then we deliver it over a network to what we refer to as a thin client. And a desktop machine that's not running a client operating system that gets the client OS dynamically from the cloud and that appears on the screen for the user. So their operating system is actually working up in the cloud and it's just being presented to them down on their machine. Now, does this give you any pause for concern or challenge? The thing that I immediately think of is what about keeping their data safe? Yeah, that's the challenge for us cloud designers in a virtual desktop infrastructure type situation. As they're creating data, we need to be able to typically store it and back it up in the cloud. So that's still going to be a concern for us. In some environments, they will allow that data to be stored locally, but in a lot of VDI environments, everything will be kept in the cloud. Not only their desktop, but the data that they are creating. 
Now, some information that you're responsible for knowing about cloud-based server virtualization is the basic steps that you would go through with any cloud vendor in order to do this. So I'm going to demonstrate this in Amazon Web Services, but keep in mind the specifics you're not responsible for. It's just the overall process that would be common across any cloud vendor that you're using. Inside of Amazon Web Services, we can see there's this compute area, and there's something called EC2. Now, you can see that I have two running instances right now in my cloud. We have this Windows Server 2016 system that's running, and then I have a Linux box without a name. I went through the cloud with a server with no name. So this machine is also running this Linux box. Let's run through those steps together that would be used to create a new instance. So I click the launch instance button, and then we have all these wonderful server and client products that we can choose from. Notice that there's this free tier eligible indication on some of these, meaning that if you're set up with the free account and you want to experiment with this stuff, you can. I'll choose this free tier eligible Red Hat Linux distribution, and so we'll select that. Now the next step is super common, and I want you to know it. It's to choose the size of the server that you need. Notice there's a free tier eligible T2 micro type. And T2 Micro is just their internal naming convention at Amazon Web Services for different server sizes. Notice this is going to give us a virtual CPU, it's going to give us one gig of RAM, and it's going to use Elastic Block Store storage. EBS storage in Amazon Web Services is meant to act just like a traditional hard drive. You really wouldn't be able to tell it from the traditional disk drive. Next, we have some instance details, like where in our virtual private cloud is this going to spin up? Remember, we can select a certain part of the United States or some other country to make this readily accessible for customers in that country. The next thing we'll do is make sure that we know the storage sizing we're going to get. In this case, it will be a 10 gig SSD general purpose drive that is virtualized for us. Next, we can add tags. If we don't want a server with no name, we can add a name key value and we'll call ours like test underscore server, for instance. Next up, we do security. And that's the third big step I want you to memorize. So the first one was choosing the server. The second one was sizing the server. And the third one that we always have to do to be safe is set up security. Notice in Amazon Web Services, this is done with something called a security group. And we're going to allow by default SSH from any IP address. If we were building a web server, we'd probably go in and add HTTP from any IP address, and we'd add HTTPS from any IP address. By the way, as far as the SSH access goes, in real life, I wouldn't allow that from any address, would I? That's for management purposes, the secure shell protocol. So I would definitely come here and put in the IP address range that I'm using at my home office, let's say, to manage this server that we're spinning up. Once you have all these settings selected, we can review our options that we chose and then click the launch button to launch our virtual machine. The last security step is to either choose a key pair, and the key pair is used instead of a password to further ensure security, and we can just choose a key pair that we have set up in Amazon Web Services or create a new one right from here. I set one up in anticipation of this demonstration called My Key, and we will go ahead and use that one and now we've done it. We are launching that Red Hat Linux distribution inside our public cloud of Amazon Web Services. So cool. If you click on the hyperlink, which is your instance ID, you'll go to a console that literally shows you that box spinning up. Right now it's in a pending state. Shortly it will go to a started state and we could actually access it using a public DNS or public IP address that will appear here in the console once it's fully started. 
So in this nugget, you and I focused on two types of virtualization, didn't we? Server virtualization, and then an extension of that where we actually virtualize clients and push them down to desktops, and that's called the virtual desktop infrastructure. We also discussed the steps that we would use in server virtualization in a cloud environment, and that would involve at the very least three things, wouldn't it? Selecting the appropriate image that we wanna run, sizing that image hardware, in our case we did that one virtual CPU and one gig of RAM, and then of course making sure security settings are in place. I hope you found this nugget informative, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.